Welcome to The Natural Nurse and Dr. Z right here on Progressive Radio Network, and that's Gary Knowles Network. Dr. Zambrone and I really enjoy bringing you our shows here on The Natural Nurse and Dr. Z. And if you're listening live, that's great. You can even call into the show if you'd like with questions about what's going on in your life in terms of natural health and wellness. Um, and you can call in and ask myself and our guest questions as well at 888-874-4888. And today I have as my guest Akshata Nayak. Akshata was born and raised in the city of Bangalore in southern India, and she earned several master's degrees here in the United States, one in biochemistry and a master's in applied clinical nutrition. She has participated in the um, basic research in the fields of immunology and emergency medicine for six years, and then she refocused her energy into establishing a business that helps to create balance in overall health. Presently, she works as a nutritionist at Alternative Roots Wellness Center, a holistic health center that she started along with her husband, Dr. Gregory Jasson. She also established the Orange Owl Shop, which provides all-natural skincare products that are handmade in an eco-friendly and socially conscious manner. The Orange Owl products are 100% chemical-free with no parabens, dyes, silicones, tylates, phylates, sulfates, fragrance oils, or petroleum products of any kind. The packaging also is green, and all the products are vegan. So on today's show, Akshata will discuss the dangers associated with chemicals found in commercial cosmetics and how to correctly decipher ingredient labels in both food and skin care preparations, as well as the overall health benefits of using all-natural products. So thank you so much for joining us us today, Akshata. Hi, Dr. Kamai. Thank you so much for having me on your show. I'm very excited. (laughs) I know, and we're very pleased to have you. You know, I will tell my audience that we have very often very seasoned guests here on The Natural Nurse and Dr. Z, but the last few shows, I have actually decided to bring on board some new and up coming stars in the holistic health movement, and I really believe that you are one of those. Why well, thank you, you so much. <laughs> oh, yes, and we'll talk about why. Now, let's, let's go back in time a little bit, and when yeah. you were raised in India, because I do know in other countries, sometimes there's more of an awareness and focus that natural products and processes are still in place more than they tend to be in the United States. Was that true in your life? Um, well, I was um, I was born and raised in a city in India, so it was not in um, the rural environment. Um, so I would say most of um, the focus was on Western medicine. However, I did grow up with my grandparents at home, my extended family. Um, I remember my maternal uh, grandmom used to um, visit us very often, and something that she did, which is still you know in my mind to, to this day, though I cannot explain how it works or you know what the theory behind it is anytime we had a stomach um, any type of a stomach issue or an upset tummy she would make me lie down and use clarified butter or ghee on our stomach and uh, that i guess ghee is a very commonly used component of ayurvedic treatments and it's very widely used um, so that was something that stuck with me and uh, i had my paternal grandparents living with us uh, while growing up and so they also had you know if, if you had a cold you would do turmeric and milk and things like that so though i never understood it and i thought it was very odd because being a kid i didn't know what was going on uh, but i do remember using these in uh, growing up, so I won't well, say that to, I'm. I do want yeah, to. I want to revisit part of what you said because yeah. some of our listeners may not be familiar with ghee, but yeah. ghee is really a what's called clarified butter, and it's yeah. amazing. It has been used in traditional Ayurvedic medicine in India yeah. and many other places around the world for thousands of years, both as a food and a medicine. What I find so interesting about it in terms of our 
um, topics for today is that one of the things that has been discovered is that the butyric acid and other active components in ghee actually can enter the body transdermally which means if you put it on your skin, like you were talking about your grandmother putting it on your stomach. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, it does do that. And the other thing that has been discovered is even with, you know, um, as a nutritionist, I tell people that a little bit of butter is fine because of the butyric acid in it. That actually helps support the good bacteria in your gut. Um, so I don't know if that was the relationship between using ghee on the stomach when you had an upset tummy or anything like that. I'm not really sure what the background is for it, but from having done research now, that is the closest thing that I've found as, as a link between the two, that, you know, transdermally it can come go through and it helps feed the good bacteria in your gut so it can help you when um, your uh, gut is inflamed. Yes, and see, that's so interesting because when we look back at the traditional use of mm-hmm. all kinds of natural medicines, such as botanical medicine and natural skin care, which will be our topic today, what we yeah. find is that the ancients always knew that things worked, but they didn't yeah. necessarily know why. And, yeah. and you know, it, let's say... I'll, I'll, give you one from more of a western perspective they always burned rosemary when they brought people up from the dungeon into the court and they did it because they just did it but now we know that it actually did lend some protection to the judges and jurors from the people who had been kept in the dungeon because when they burn rosemary, it actually releases essential oils, which we'll be talking about later, which we now know are highly antimicrobial. Okay. Yeah, rosemary is one of the most uh, or the most uh, vital antimicrobials that you can find, yes. Rosemary extracts. And so, of, of course, they didn't know that at the time. Yeah. <laughs> But that's what I'm saying. Just like with all kinds of ancient remedies and old wives' tales, we find that there is a reason behind those things, even though the yes. people who originated them just knew it worked. They didn't know why. Yeah, yeah. if it's passed down from generation to generation, there's a reason that it has lasted those many passing downs. <laughs> Now, Akshata, you shared with us that you were really um, born and raised in a cosmopolitan manner for the most part. You weren't living in a a little shack in the middle of a place that wasn't uh, developed. It was very cosmopolitan. It was very Western. Um, Now, what got you interested then in studying nutrition and its link to health? (laughs) <laughs> it was a bit of a, a long road that got me there, um, but I think um, I actually started out doing um, in research, studying immunology and uh, toxicology, and something that I was very interested in from when I was a kid was, you know, I wanted to study medicine, I wanted to do all those things, um, and somehow be um, involved in treating people with, you know, different um, ailments or w- whatever you can call it. Um, um, so I think, but what finally changed me from thinking of it of you know the the regular medicine way and going to nutrition and alternative medicine was um, just my own personal health. And I think this is true for a lot of people. You know, you can study anything, you can be recommended a lot of things. If you have a personal story of something that has helped you, that will always trump everything else. <laughs> And um, so that is exactly what happened with me. Uh, A few years ago, I had a lot of different health um, issues that needed to be addressed, which were just progressively getting worse and worse as time was uh, passing. And I didn't know what could be done. I had tried a whole bunch of different medications, um, exercises, you know, all, all the things that I could think of I had tried, and none of it had worked. And uh, my husband at the time, uh, Dr. Greg Geisen, uh he was in uh, New York Chiropractic College in Seneca Falls, and he took me to go see his, uh, meet with his mentor. And um, I was very amazed by this little lady. She is packed full of energy. She looked at a list of symptoms I had given her, didn't give me five million things to treat each and every single treatment, each and every single symptom. Instead, she said, this is the underlying cause. Let's treat this. 
And within a few months, I saw a change. And that is what got me interested in studying how did she figure that out. That was my biggest question, was to understand how she figured that out. And once she was instrumental in setting up the nutrition program at New York Chiropractic College, and so that's how I got involved in that and started studying it and took it forward. Yes, and that's where I met you as well, we'll yes. share with our <laughs> listeners. Um, we have a personal story here, and it's a great yes. human interest story, because I was actually teaching at New York Chiropractic College in the program that you were taking, which is a master's in clinical nutrition, yes. and um, you were one of my students, and I gave the students an assignment, and I'll tell you, listeners, what, why I decided to give this assignment. Many highly educated uh, Western doctors and Western practitioners, such as Akshata, did begin to incorporate into their life and their treatment protocols once they figured out the testing modalities from some of the higher level testing organizations, they often used botanical medicine. But usually they would be using it as a pill. They would actually give the person a bottle of herbs, which of course I use in my practice as well. But I felt like part of their training should be getting in touch with the plant material itself and actually find plants and make something, just like uh, actually herbalists did and pharmacists did and physicians did in the old days, even if they just did it once in their whole life and then go right back to, <laughs> to going ahead and using the pills. So we had an assignment, and maybe you can share what you did, because I was very impressed with the outcome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I was very happy about that. Um, the assignment was to make something with herbs. We had to choose an herb of choice. Then we had to do um, a whole write-up about why we chose the herb, what its benefits were, what it can be used for. And then using that um, herb, we had to make something with it that could be used by somebody for whatever, you know, uh, for whatever treatment purposes they needed it. And um, so I had sat, you know, we had gone through quite a few classes, but I didn't think I was well-versed enough to understand or figure out exactly the best way to do a tincture or something like that. So instead, um, I paid attention to something else that had been occupying my headspace quite a bit at that point of time. So just to step back a little... I have my master's in biochemistry, and my thesis for that was I'm studying the effects of environmental toxic, uh, toxins on the immune system. So specifically, it was arsenic and the ability, the genetic ability to form um, a response to a bacterial or a viral infection. And I saw that it was significantly reduced if you were exposed to just one toxin, that's arsenic, at levels that are uh, permitted in the environment by the Environmental Protection Agency. So that sort of shocked me a little, and I started looking at just products that were, you know, used in life every day, uh, cleaning products, skincare products, all sorts of things, and started finding all these different chemicals in it. And I didn't know why they were there. I didn't know what to do about this knowledge at that time. So I just sort of tried to find alternatives and left it there. When I started the nutrition course, I started doing more in-depth research in what these different chemicals can do to you. And that's when I started paying more attention to my skincare products. So around the same time that you gave us this assignment uh, was when I was doing a lot of research into skincare products and, you know, soaps and why are all these sulfates in it, why are all these different things in it. Some of the ingredients were ones I had used in labs where I was required to use gloves, goggles, lab coats, and things like that. So when I got that assignment, I knew I wanted to try making something that could be used as a topical, uh, for a topical application. And so that's when I made a, a lovely ginger-infused soap. I used um, the ginger juice and ginger pulp and infused it um, in a soap recipe that I came up with. And that's what I presented and submitted as my assignment, which I'm very happy to hear you liked a lot. <laughs> it was wonderful. I actually had all the students, and I, stu I still do this, by the way, if anybody's out there interested in learning how to make your own herbal medicines, you can go to my website at naturalnurse.com and look under education. And what Akshata and all the other students had to actually do was mail me their project. And 
every day boxes show up at my house with these <laughs> wonderful, not always so wonderful. And by the way, you were not graded on how well it came out. You were just graded on sharing with me in writing a paper that you had to write, which included the process of how it was yes. done, how you came up with the idea, and then also the scientific data about why this might work from yes. an active constituent and mechanism of action standpoint. So it went everywhere yes. from gathering the plant to beginning to understand how it works on a molecular biochemical level. So these were wonderful projects. Now, some of the ones that were sent in really came out not so great, but that doesn't mean you got a bad grade as long as you talked about your process. But yours, Akshata, was particularly brilliant and was a wonderful thing that I actually wound up using myself. And then <laughs> let's continue discussing where that went from there in your life. Yeah, so I made the soap, and I actually chose ginger because of its warming um, abilities. And so there was some research out there that supported the use of ginger topically for um, diabetics who usually have problems with their extremities. You know, you can have neuropathies and things like that. And so because of the warming properties of ginger, it actually helps increase blood flow in your extremities. That was the research that I found um, that I used uh, to come up with that recipe for the soap. And so once I did that, um, it for Christmas that year, um, I decided to make soap for everybody for Christmas. And so this is truly tested on unsuspecting friends and relatives, all my recipes. Um, it started at that point of time. So I made it for all my friends and um, relatives, and they all really liked it. And, you know, it was one of those things where I thought, you know, everyone's being polite. They say they like it, but everybody next year wanted refills. Um, after the soap was uh, done and over with, they wanted refills. And I was like, hmm. So I made some more, and as I gave it away to more people, I realized that everybody came back with the same uh, reviews saying just how wonderful it was that, you know, it wasn't a scent that made them feel like a bouquet of flowers all day long, um, and it wasn't harsh on their skin. And so, you know, some of them actually told me they didn't even feel like they needed to use moisturizers after they used the soap a few times. And so that really got me thinking. And I realized that I had somehow stumbled upon this recipe that worked really well, and I had all these ingredients with me. So I started seeing what else I could make with those ingredients. And so slowly and steadily, it sort of snowballed into this whole line of products that I ended up with. And um, that's where I decided to set up um, shop, the Orange Owl, and I've taken it forward from there. And I do want to tell our listeners that a very good place to find out more is at www.theorangeowlshop.com. The Orange Owl Shop dot com. Now, as we move forward in the story, it, it really develops <laughs> because then Akshata did graduate the program and did um, get, along with another master she already had, and now she is has a master's in clinical nutrition. And that was a very comprehensive course, by the way. My cl course was only one class as part of a yeah. two-year intensive program. And you yes. did, of course, find out where to do all those kinds of testing that, that first you wondered, how did the doctor find out um, what yes. was wrong with someone, and, yes. and much more. And you did continue with the orange owl, and then just a few months ago, I was walking around at Natural Products, was it East? Natural Products East yes, Expo in Baltimore, East, yes. because I go, I've gone to so many for the last 27 years, <laughs> Expo East and Expo West. And there was Akshata with a beautiful booth at a major um, a expo with all kinds of producers of natural products, and you had a beautiful booth there exhibiting many of the creations that, that you have come up with at the Orange Owl. Yes, it, it was very. It was a very exciting moment for me, and it was um, such a coincidence because at that exact moment, somebody had stopped by and they really liked the products, and they asked me, "So, what got you started making these products?" And I was just explaining to them that you know I had this professor who gave us an assignment for an herbology class, 
and you walked in and i just looked at you and i was like really <laughs> what were the chances that this would happen so it was very exciting for me to meet you there and it was a huge huge opportunity for the orange owl to be at that expo and we got a lot of exposure from that um and we've brought a lot of stores on board because of it and it's it's a very exciting opportunity to be taking um the business end of it forward you know sharing my story is always something that i'm always happy to do uh but this is all also good and you know getting me the support to sort of push it forward a little bit more and we're going to talk more in depth about your formulations and excellent ingredients when we come back from our break so right now listeners we're going to take a little break right here on the progressive radio network and we're going to hear a natural medicine chest and remember you can catch our show the natural nurse and dr z every tuesday from 10 to 11 a.m. but you can also listen online at progressive radio network our progr- uh, prn.fm archives anytime day or night we'll be right back with more right here on the natural nurse and dr z on this edition of the natural medicine chest we'll talk about high blood pressure or hypertension Hypertension or high blood pressure is a disease of the western world and a product of modern civilization. Cultures that continue to adhere to an indigenous lifestyle, which includes low stress levels, a non-refined whole foods diet, as well as vigorous exercise, experience virtually no episodes of essential hypertension. It is very interesting to note that when individuals from these societies emigrate to western countries and adopt western habits, they too fall prey to hypertension. Naturopathic treatment of hypertension has not changed essentially in the last century. The mainstay of the treatment still relies on diet, exercise, stress reduction, lifestyle modification, with secondary support from other modalities such as hypotensive phytotherapy or herbal medicine. hydrotherapy which is the therapeutic use of water clinical nutrition as well as homeopathy we'll focus on phytotherapy in this edition of the natural medicine chest let's talk about taraxacum officinalis this is an unpopular nuisance to many homeowners trying to build that perfect lawn however this common weed the dandelion is a powerful yet safe botanical medicine for the treatment of hypertension In a Romania study in 1974, the common dandelion was found to be as potent a diuretic as a commonly used drug called Lasix. Dandelion, however, due to its rich levels of potassium, acted against potassium ion depletion, a dangerous condition known as hypokalemia. seen as a side effect of many anti-hypertensive drugs which promote diuresis. The leaf of the dandelion was a more effective medicine than the root, although the root is utilized by naturopathic physicians and has a powerful liver-specific medicinal quality. Crotagus oxycantha, also known in the vernacular as hawthorn, is a common tree in the family Rosaceae or the rose family. Extracts of the plant in the western literature date back far beyond the Middle Ages. Even the Chinese were privy to its usage. especially as a digestive tonic. The therapeutic principles are found in extracts from the leaves, berry-like fruits, as well as the flowers. In Europe, Crotagus is well respected for its effects at lowering blood pressure, blood lipids, reducing angina attacks, and preventing and perhaps reversing atherosclerotic deposition in arterial walls. This plant has demonstrated a remarkable safety record, but because of its powerful effects, it should not be used with certain cardiac or hypotensive drugs and should be used by a qualified practitioner of alternative medicine other herbs are also helpful for hypertension such as garlic olive and olive oil and ginkgo biloba so if the pressures of life are making your blood boil don't forget about these herbal medicines the next time you reach into the natural medicine chest And 
And welcome back once again to The Natural Nurse and Dr. Z. This is Ellen Kamai, The Natural Nurse, and you can always get in touch with me by going to the website naturalnurse.com or Facebook The Natural Nurse. And also you can find uh, contact me through Nature's Answer by going to naturesanswer.com or Facebook Nature's Answer. Today we are discussing natural skin care with Akshata Nayak. She has a master's degree, uh, several master's degrees, in fact, in biochemistry and also in applied clinical nutrition. And we're discussing how her, her personal story about, I think it's fabulous, about her studies and the fact that she is now a nutritionist and she has started an all-natural skin care line based on research that actually happened in a class that she took where I was an instructor, so it's, it is a personal story. But let's talk more about the Orange Owl. And for those listeners who'd like to visit your website, it is the orangeowlshop.com. Let's t- yes. look in depth at why you choose the kinds of ingredients that you do. 100% chemical free, no parabens, dyes, silicons, uh, phthalates, sulfates, fragrance oils, or petroleum products. Why do you do that? I know one thing. I know that's costly. And I do want to yeah. ask you a question that I hear from other natural skin care um products you you have them and you have excellent prices and also yep. we hear from other providers that they have a problem with microorganisms now yep. how do you deal with those two issues um, well the reason I choose the ingredients that I do there are two big things that I always look for one is the um, ecological impact of using or the environmental impact of using a particular ingredient so where is it sourced from and how is it process. Those are the one big thing that um, sort of influences whether I choose an ingredient or not. The other equally important aspect or quality of the ingredient is what it means to your health. What does it do? Is it beneficial? Is it harmful in any way? So those are the two big things that I look at whenever I decide to choose any ingredient. In terms of um, pricing, um, it's basically, it depends on, you know, the more things you buy in bulk, you obviously do better in, in that term when you're looking for ingredients. And I always prefer having a good relationship with my source of ingredients rather than going for all sorts of, you know, certifications or anything like that. I prefer getting my ingredients from somebody that I can talk to and get information from exactly where it's gone from plant to the ingredient that I'm getting. So that is extremely important for me. Um, about the microorganisms, I do use preservatives. However, they're not the chemical ones. I don't use parabens and things like that. What I use instead are products like vitamin E oil, um, grapefruit seed extract. So those actually um, work really well as antimicrobials and antioxidants to keep the oils from going rancid as well. And um, the lowest shelf life, the shortest shelf life for any of my products is about 9 to 10 months, which I think is pretty good for a natural product, which I know will be used regularly, which I know from my previous um, reorders from customers is, you know, that's about the span that it lasts anyway, um, average. And so it works out pretty good. So where something that's a chemical commercial product might sit on the shelf for many years. That's something you yes. can't do with yours. They have to be used when they're fresh. And I yes. imagine some of them, I mean, if people wanted to refrigerate them, it would extend the life. Yes, definitely. I'm talking about shelf life, like just on your, you know, vanity or, you know, if you keep it in on your, your shower, I'm talking about those types of situations. If you refrigerate it, obviously it'll last longer. Um, I, you know, I, I love making my products when it's colder, <laughs> just because they, they seem to do much better in the cold than when it's extremely hot. You know, all my products are just oil. So if you take any of my body butters and leave it in the car, it'll melt to complete oil. In in, in a very short period of time. So those are things that you want to avoid. But if you keep it just on your shelf or in a store if it's kept on a shelf, if, it'll do good for about eight to nine months. Um, but when I get my reorders from stores as well, it's usually within four to five months. So I, I'm very sure that the products that are on the shelf that you're getting for the orange owl are, you know, they're, they're fresh. They're not, they've not sat there forever. Now, 
I'm looking at one. I'm looking on your website, theorangeowlshop.com, yep. and I'm looking at the body butter. So, yep. first of all, everything's in glass. Why is that important to you? Um, it's it's not in glass. Those are actually plastic containers. I'm looking to shift over to glass, obviously, because of the environmental impact. But when I started for the type of investment that I could do, this is the best that I could afford to start out with. Um, and the, and yeah. I want to read the ingredients to our listeners. Yeah. It's just amazing. Yeah. If we look at this, you really want to eat it instead of put it on your skin. <laughs> um, so I, <laughs> one I picked, I just chose one, um, the Lemon Twist. So yes. the ingredients are mango butter, organic mm-hmm. oil of jojoba, almond, avocado, and olive, and vitamin E. The preservative you list as grapefruit seed extract. And mm-hmm. then there's essential oils of lemon, grapefruit, and lime. That yeah. sounds a whole lot better than when I read some of these commercial products. Yes. Um, yeah, there are absolutely no chemicals. It's so funny. Um, I've had a few customers write in to me for that actual, for that exact product, saying it looks like frosting. It smells like frosting. I want to slather this thing on toast and eat it. <laughs> and what would happen if you did? Um, I've actually, you know, I've I've been dared to taste it and see what it's like. It doesn't taste bad. The texture is kind of weird because of the mango butter in it. But it's a whipped mango butter, so it's not, I mean, there's nothing bad in it for you. There's absolutely nothing that will harm you. Um, But I would prefer it if people judge the product by the way it feels and the smell rather than the taste. Absolutely. (laughs) But, you know, just just hearing it, uh, I'm sure, over the radio makes some people think, wow, that sounds delicious. And every single (laughs) formula is like that. Now, let's talk about some of the things that people will find if they read a label. And I'll tell you, sometimes the labels that say organic products, even in the health food store, will still have a lot of chemicals and sulfates and petroleum products. So what are some of those bad words and and why are they bad yeah i think the phrase all natural is one of the most abused phrases these days because everybody wants to term everything is all natural um given this whole rise and you know this alternative idea of going back to uh the basics eating as close to nature as possible and all those things um however there are chemicals which have been deemed safe for use by the fda that's that's the certification that they give it it's deemed safe for use by the fda and you you can still use those in your formulations and label your product as all natural, um, which I think is extremely misleading. So it really, um, you know, for, for lack of a better word, it does annoy me, um, and I feel really bad for people um, that are trying to do the right thing. I mean, you know, obviously the Orange Owl is not the only company that is trying to make a difference in, in these terms. There are others as well that are trying to be, um, you know, no chemicals, trying to set it up the best way that they can. And when we say that our products are all natural um, and somebody else with chemicals can also say it, it seems really misleading and it's not very fair. However, that is allowed. Um, There are a lot of different chemicals that you can find in products which label themselves as all natural. And, you know, you did talk about the sulfates, the parabens. Um, You can have certain phenols in it. You can have alcohols in it. And uh, since these are deemed safe for use, they can still be considered all natural. So uh, so let's go into some of those chemicals. Just pick one and and, uh, go into it more deeply so people do turn their labels around and begin to look at if their products do in fact contain that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So one thing, I'd have to talk about a combination because of the way that it works together. Uh, Polyethylene glycol, um, or it's labeled as PEG, um, so these, uh, this is extremely, it's, it's very prevalent in um, almost all skincare products that you find from whether brands consider themselves all natural or not. Um, now, PEG, funny enough, I used to use it in my lab as an antifreeze. Um, and this is now used in uh, skincare products in combination with an alcohol, like a sterile alcohol. Um, these, the combination of the two of them form a matrix of sorts. Uh, which helps carry ingredients transdermally, which should be scary in and of itself because um, 
I think a lot of it has to do with the way things are marketed to us these days is, you know, if, if you use something that feels greasy, even for a few seconds before it naturally absorbs into your skin, you automatically think, oh, my God, this is greasy. It's going to, you know, everything I touch is going to get greasy as well. We are sort of conditioned to believe that any lotion that you use should sort of absorb into your skin right away. And that is what these pro- these ingredients are used for. Any type of an alcohol in combination with a PEG or a polyethylene glycol is used to basically carry products through your skin so it happens as fast as possible so you're not left with that film type of a feeling on, on top. And it and, is effective. Um, it does do that. But then, yeah, you know, it's, what it's else? Yeah, it's very effective. Do? Yeah, it's extremely effective in carrying things through your skin. Then you have to think about all the ingredients that are in the product, which are also, um, as a consequence, getting carried through into your skin. And so that can be all types of phenols. It can be, um, you know, all types of the, the different chemicals that constitute a perfume. Um, it can be so many different things. And one of them was about the phenols. And I found this. I was trying to find more recent articles because a lot of the research I'd done was a few years old, you know, when I started uh, doing all my formulations. But something that I did find was in Environmental Science and Technology, uh, this was published in uh, 2012, November, actually. This is extremely recent. And they found um, that for kids uh, between the ages of 3 to 11 years old, if they were exposed to uh, either precursors or phenols in products, and um, they found them in about 60% of the serum uh, samples that they took. They collected about 936 children samples, and 60% of them had um, an increase in the different types of phenols that can be found in all these products. Um, just because you know they are exposed to it, that's what's used on them. Unfortunately, even the products that even the products that say baby soap have these in. Yes, them. yes, that's exactly what I was going to say. If you look at products that are specifically um, sort of marketed or set up for baby products, baby use, even those have you know all those no tear type of products. All of these have all these chemicals in it, which are thanks to some of the ingredients that are used, go through your skin really quickly and they accumulate there. To be found in, in the serum, uh, the, the serum was collected, I think, in 2001, and they did this study in 2012. Um, and to find, you know, all these different phenols in them, that's, that's a little scary. <laughs> it certainly is. Well, we're going yes. to continue our discussion in a moment, and we'll go into other petroleum uh, products, um, you know, parabens, sulfates, other things. And it's so excellent listening to you discuss the actual science, seeing as you are actually very highly educated in the science as well as the natural side. And that's a fabulous combination. So we're going to go for a little break right here. You might want to visit Akshata's website while we take the break, which is at theorangeowlshop.com. And we'll be right back with more right here here on Progressive Radio Network, The Natural Nurse and Dr. Z. And welcome back once again to The Natural Nurse and Dr. Z. This is Ellen Kamai, The Natural Nurse, and you can find us at naturalnurse.com, Facebook, The Natural Nurse, or check out naturesanswer.com or Facebook, Nature's Answer. So you definitely can track us down very easily. And today we are talking to the originator of the Orange Owl, and you can find her at theorangeowlshop.com. And this is Akshata Nayak. She has a master's in applied clinical nutrition as well as biochemistry. What a fabulous combination for what you're doing now, Akshata, because you're understanding both why, why these things work and yes. how they work and why yes. you want natural products. I'm looking at your lip balm. I just want to read from our listeners another list here of delicious ingredients. Now, this is a lip balm. People put lipstick and lip balms on their lips 
so I imagine mm-hmm. a whole lot of stuff can be absorbed, not only yes. transdermally, but because, <laughs> yeah, some gets in the mouth. And yours is organic oils of jojoba, coconut, avocado, and castor, candelia wax, and vitamin E with vegetable glycerin, cinnamon, and cardamom. Compare that to what's in a commercial lip balm, and you will see this looks so much better. Yeah, and actually I get uh, extremely good reviews for what the lip balms feel like because they're not very waxy. I don't keep them almost like a salve, so they go on really well, and people you know, like it a lot. When you have um, other additives like, you know, petroleum uh, jelly and other types of things in your lip balm, those are actually drying for your skin. So you end up using more and more of the product because you keep thinking, oh, my lips are dry again, my lips are dry again. So you use more. And that actually is sort of counterintuitive because the ingredients in the product itself are causing the issue. (laughs) So it's a sort of a cycle and you have to break that somewhere. Either, you know, stop using it or deal with dry lips. It's one or the other. And uh, so that's where the lip balm uh, recipe came from, is to try and figure out something that would work really well. Um, Also, sort of goes against a very conventional business model because that that lip balm lasts a lot since you don't use too much of it. You don't use it all the time. You don't have to reuse it again and again. Are you saying that part of what goes into developing commercial products at times is sort of planned obsolescence, looking at the fact that you will use it up quickly and have to buy a new one? And yeah, I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm not always a fan of painting big companies as evil or anything like that. Uh, but I do think in, in some of, I don't know if it's a conscious effort or if it's just a side effect of the recipes and the formulations that they come up with. So okay, well, what is, you know, what you is did, wrong? Yeah. Let, um, you did tell us, you know, what is wrong with, with some of the other additives that people will see when they're reading their labels on all their skincare products, very often, mm-hmm. even if it says all natural. So something um, like petroleum. Says, yeah, um, petroleum products, like I said, one is obviously the environmental impact of sourcing the petroleum products. Uh, petroleum jelly and even mineral oil and things like that, what these do is they just form a coating on your skin. They don't always, mineral oil doesn't really absorb through your skin or anything like that. It just forms a coating, so it doesn't even allow your skin to breathe well. And that is, you know, a definite problem where you can start having all sorts of skin issues because your skin is just not able to breathe. Um, The other thing that people can use in all-natural products um, is... um, fragrances and there's a huge difference between fragrances and essential oils and what they offer as properties now Um, i do want to talk about that but you know when i walk into let's say a candle shop yeah where they have i find it truthfully sickening like i actually get a headache when i when i smell a lot of those artificial chemical scents what kind of molecule is that um, it it really depends. I mean, if you talk to anybody who's worked in a chemistry lab for a while, you they will tell you that all chemicals have their own distinct smell. You know, like acetic acid is the smell of vinegar. Um, esters, most of the esters smell very fruity. So a lot of the fruity scents that you get come from a combination of different esters. Um, you know, you have benzaldehyde that smells like maraschino cherries or um, bitter almonds, like that type of a scent. So it really depends on what chemicals have been combined to give you a particular scent. And so a combination of those chemicals together is called perfume, or it can be called um, fragrances, or a fragrance blend, or maybe even a fragrance oil. And there is a big difference between how that is manufactured versus how an essential oil is extracted. Um, and so it's, it's very important to make sure that you stay away from the fragrances. There has been a lot of research that has shown that uh, people with... Um, um, uh, who are sort of more prone to having asthma or uh, respiratory uh, conditions can actually, all those can be exacerbated by perfumes, 
um, or by fragrance oils and fragrance blends, all these different chemicals. Um, so severe and atopic asthma increases are seen. And there was, you know, this research article that I found, it was 1995, um, but in the Annals of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, which talks about how um, they check the effect of all these different um, perfumes and colognes, um, even products on uh, people who are prone to asthma, and they saw that it always increased the incidence. So it's, you know, definitely um, something to be very careful about when you look at your products. You want to make sure that it's the list of essential oils are there, or it says, you know, it can also say a proprietary blend of essential oils if they don't want to tell you which ones they're using. But essential oils will always be better for you than um, the chemical fragrances. Now, is the term essential oil regulated, shall we say? I, I did have um, uh, Kurt Schaumblas on a different show, and, and he's the head of Original Swiss Aromatics, which are very high-quality essential yep. oils, and he discussed all that with us. But yep. what if it says essential oil on the label, is that a regulated term, which means you're actually definitely getting an oil versus a chemical substitute? Um, yeah, essential oils have to be the natural product. Um, I'm pretty sure that a chemical substitute cannot be labeled as essential oils. However, like he said, there are different grades of essential oils that you can get. So again, it depends on where you're sourcing it from and, um, you know, how much it costs and, you know, all those types of things. There is a little bit of research that goes into all of that uh, to determine if you're getting the best one that you possibly can. And the only way that you can really find out is talking to the people who've come up with the formulation, hoping that they've done the research, or if they give you the source, talking to the source directly and seeing what they have to say about it. So that's another thing you can look at. Like you can see yep. if it just says the, the scent, which might be an artificial fragrance, or if it says essential oils like the Orange Owl products do. Yeah. So that's something yeah, that is the reason at. that even on my website, I list what the ingredients are. And not only that, I list what each ingredient is used for so that people know exactly what's going on and why I have used something that I have used. I think that's very important because most people, when you look at the label, you know, it's, it's just... It looks like Latin and, you know, everything else to you because you, you can't pronounce half the ingredients on there. Um, and you also don't know what any of that is being used for. So I think it's very, very important that people know um, so that they can make an informed decision. So actually learn what the parabens are, methyl parabens. Well, just that is a great little tip, and that's true. I know you're also a nutritionist besides the yes. skin care line, and I always tell my um, patients that as well. When you read the back of any food or cosmetic, you should be able to pronounce every word and recognize it as some kind of food word. Yes. Rather yes, than a long really chemical. Important. Now, yep, sometimes some a them... long chemical name could be harmless and sometimes yeah. not if you don't know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And something that can also be true is that um, some, if a particular uh, brand or a, um, a product has come under FDA regulations as a cosmetic, they need to use, um, you know, the botanical name of the product. So, you know, they'd have to, instead of saying just almond oil, they would have to give the botanical name of almond. So if that comes into play, then they're always required in parentheses after that to say what it is. So, you know, it would have the botanical name of almond, and in parentheses it will say almond, and then the word oil next to it. So you just want to make sure that even if there are words that you cannot pronounce, you want to look for these parentheses and see if that exists so that you know what's, you know, what you're getting. Now, we often see in regular commercial skincare products, they have separate lines like face lotion, body lotion, hands, feet. Um, yeah. Is, is that really necessary or is it just the same thing being promoted for different uses? Um, I think one is that, you know, the, the whole monetary thing that goes into it, some types of products for certain areas of your skin can be priced a bit higher versus others. That's one thing. But the other thing is also, from what I understand about it, is that certain chemicals are, are harsher to your facial skin um, relative to the rest of your body. And um, so if you have products that have chemicals in it, then you need a separate one for your face, a separate one 
for something else and, you know, things like that. If you have a product that works with your body oils instead of against it, with your skin oils, then I don't really see the necessity, if you're talking about a moisturizer, that you need different um, products for different parts of your body. What I would recommend instead is how much you use of a particular product on different parts of your body. For example, the body butters that I have, I don't recommend that people slather that on their face because it would be really oily. Um, what I recommend is using it on your hands and whatever you have left behind on your palms, just sort of dab your face with it, and that tends to do the job pretty well. And and that's something that's different with the natural things as well. And, yes. you know, when somebody's reading their labels, I think that making sure that they're aren't all those preservatives is such an important thing. On the other hand, you do want some things that do preserve any kind of um, cosmetic or body care application because you don't want it to get full of bacteria. Yes, that's very true. And, you know, like I said, there are a lot of natural preservatives available. Um, They might not, you know, like you said, they won't allow the product to sit on the shelf for years and years. That is true, but that's a small price to pay for something where you're getting with absolutely no chemicals in it. Now, on your website, you you talk about a lot of the things that you add and why you use them, and that's very helpful for people to see. So yeah. what would be some of the reasons for some of the things that you use? Um, for uh, some of the things that I use, um, the only chemical that I would, I, I, is I use baking soda in my uh, bath salts, and that is I use it as a water softener because not everybody has soft water. So just adding a little bit of baking soda to the water helps soften it. Um, I use colloidal oatmeal in a lot of my um, recipes, and that is just because of the moisturizing um, properties that it has for the skin. Um, I use a lot of organic oils which are sourced well and um, the funny thing about organic oils also is that they could be grown organically but if they're processed with a bunch of chemicals after they're harvested they can still be called organic to a certain sense and so you have to be really careful about what type of processing your ingredients have gone through. Um, So I use a lot of uh, well-sourced organic oils in my products as well which are just very very more moisturizing. Um, I've decided to stay away from animal products just because I don't like the whole idea of animal testing of any of the ingredients or, you know, any of that type of stuff. I I don't ever want to get into that because I don't know how well things are regulated in in that sphere. So So I'll I'll mention one that, you know, is in a lot of natural products but is an animal-based product, and that would be lanolin. So that's something you would stay away from, even though it is a natural product. Yeah, I don't use lanolin. Um, I don't. I did my uh, lip balms initially used to have beeswax in them, and I don't have that um, Even anymore. That, okay. Yeah, yeah. I just sort of stay away from that whole thing. I, I worked in a lab that did animal research, and so I I sort of saw how these things were set up. Not you know the research that I did, but just getting an idea of the labs that are set up for you know animal testing of products and things like that. And I just did not want to be involved in any of in any of those types of um, situations, and that's the reason I decided not to go with any of the animal products. So your products can claim vegan as yes. well as all natural, no chemicals. Yes. Very, yep. very unusual line, and I will tell you, absolutely delightful. And uh, people can again visit the website at theorangeowl.com, and I'm sure you integrate that into your overall patient care. Like you said, if somebody comes in, a patient with allergies, you will actually ask them, like every healthcare practitioner should, about what's going on in their environment, such as their body care products, as well as what they're eating. And this is not even addressed in conventional medicine at all. No, it isn't. And I think it's one of the, you know, philosophies, if you want to call it, that our wellness center and the Orange Owl is based on is you are what you put in and on your body, um, whether you realize it or not. And, you know, obviously you can't control every single source of toxins in your life. You know, you can do the best you can in your house, but the minute you step out, you will be exposed to a whole bunch of things that you cannot control. The idea is you control as much of it as you possibly can, and that always 
things will lead you to a healthier lifestyle than not. So if somebody, even when I'm just doing a show, if somebody comes and tells me I'm sensitive to, you know, this oil or this chemical, I always talk to them not only about their skincare products, I also talk to them about their diet, I talk to them about their overall health. And the converse is true if they come in to me for a nutrition consult, I will always talk to them about obviously what they're putting into um, in their food, but also what type of products they're using, clear cleaning products, skincare products, what's, you know, where do they live, what is their house like, you know, is there a mold issue? There are so many different things that influence your health, and it's very well, important to well, address we have to all go. of we, those. We actually have oh, to sorry. go. <laughs> That's okay. Oh. I want to thank you so much for being our guest today. It was wonderful to have you on and to see you again, and I will see you again, I'm sure, and keep in touch. Listeners, you can find Akshata at the Orange Owl Shop. Com. Until next yes. time, this is Ellen Kamai, the natural nurse, hoping thank that you, very you. Much. Oh, thank you so much as well. And thank you, listeners. Be sure you stay healthy.